Welcome to episode 21 of the Bobcast, our weekly coaches show, and we begin this episode with a very strong swimming performance. Frostburg State at the CAC Championships, third on the women's side with 401 points, the best finish at for Frostburg at CACs ever. The men took fifth with 331 points, the most for any Frostburg men's team. I'm here with Justin Anderson and Coach, uh, in your fifth season, this is, is the best performance for your team uh, at CACs. You get a couple more swimmers of the year in, in Nietzsche and March, both going back-to-back. Back. In terms of a, a team effort, both sides, uh, how pleased are you with, with this result? Yeah, our coaching staff's just so incredibly proud of the way everybody swam this weekend. Top to bottom, lifetime best times across the board. There wasn't a swimmer that didn't go best time this weekend, and almost to a T, every swimmer in every event dropped time. Um, Everybody stepped up where they needed to to score points, um, whether it was first place or 16th place, and that's what made the difference and helped push our women up to third after never finishing better than sixth and helped get our men to fifth after never finishing better than sixth. They got it done. We, we have to start with uh, Nietzsche in March, uh, of course, as we have all year. Uh, Nietzsche sweeping the 50, 100, and 200 free B-cut times in the 100 and 200, repeating as the swimmer of the year. Uh, can you can you put into words going six for six the last two years in her events and also was in several relay record times, um, how challenging that is um, for her to, to just go back to back and, and sweep every event for two straight years? Yeah, it's definitely incredibly challenging, especially in the events Macy swims. The sprint freestylers tend to, or the sprint freestyles tend to be the most competitive events. Um, so to win the 50, the 100, and 200, two straight years, to basically go undefeated in dual meets for the last two years, um, is just a testament to how much she steps up in races when it matters, and to the hard work she's put in over the last few years. Um, just you know, incredible to see her put up the time she's done. Coming in from high school, she was almost seven seconds slower in her 100 free three seconds slower in her 50 free and um, nearly 30 seconds slower in her 200 free. So she's just made huge strides since she's been here. Christian March on the other side, men's swimmer of the year, three individual school records, 100 breaststroke, uh, his win, second in the 50 free and 200 breast, a couple of B-cut times, a couple of relays that set records uh, for him and in, in improving in this year. Uh, he got the B-cut times. He didn't necessarily win every race, but again, breaking his own records. Uh, what kind of accomplishment is it for, for him and, and also Macy to show up and break all of their own records and, and do it all over again? Yeah, it's definitely hard coming in year after year when you're chasing yourself, um, kind of chasing that ghost to break those records that you've set in the past. So it just is a testament to the work they put in their senior year, and it's not easy coming in you know, four straight years and, and trying to improve yourself each and every year. Um, but Christian from the first relay, they free the first night where he broke the team record, dropped three seconds in his 200 free. Um, I knew it would be a good meet for him, and he continued that momentum, breaking the 50 the next day, the 100 the next day, and the two breasts the next day. How significant is it to win? You, you know, you've been in this conference as a swimmer at, at Mary Washington. You, you've been around. How significant is it to win back-to-back -back years? Is that common? Did you expect for them to pull out back-to-back -back swimmer of the year? Yeah, it's, it's pretty rare. Um, Mary Washington's the only team that's ever done back-to-back -back on either side. Um, so for us to join, you know, with them when, when they're the... They're know, the premier team Yeah, 54-time conference champions. Um, says a lot to the program we're building here. Um, I didn't really expect it to happen again for Macy. She had some stiff competition um, with some girls from Mary Washington and York. Um, Megan Murphy had a phenomenal year. A couple NCAA B cuts, mm -hmm. and um, Justine Wants got a B cut at the to meet this weekend in the two back. Um, so I knew it would be close after Macy's 100 free. Um, I thought she had a good shot of it based on how the other girls in the conference performed that day. Um, Christian was honestly kind of a toss-up. I wasn't sure who would get the award that day. Kevin Stahl had a phenomenal meet, um, breaking the conference record in the mile and, and earning a few B cuts, and he also broke the conference record in the 500. Um, Josh Brown at Salisbury also had a great meet um, sweeping his events, but no NCAA B cuts, and I think that may have been what kept him, you know, from getting the award. Um, and Kevin being a rookie, I think, may have played a part in that. But um, Christian and then Jeff Lacrone, both really solid B cuts with high NCAA rankings. So it was kind of a four-way toss-up. I think any one of those guys deserved the award this year, and it could have been any one. And when the voting panned out, it just happened to be that Christian came out on top this year. This, this might be hard, but can you place Christian and, and Macy uh, 
in terms of Frostburg history as, as the best male and female swimmer to ever come through? Oh, with that, without a doubt, they're the best swimmers that have ever come through this program. Um, you know, Macy's probably one of the, to the top 10 best swimmers to come out of the CAC, and Christian, I think, falls in that same boat. They, they get it done, that they go back to back. What, what was really cool about this meet um, is, is the team finishes as well. And in, in order to get there, it takes more than just the top on the men's and the women's side. Uh, Maddie Weinberger, school record and winning the 100 breast school record, winning the 200 breast, breaking her own records. Uh, how did she swim and, and how, how did you, what did you make of her weekend? Yeah, Maddie had such a great, great meet this weekend um, after last year's championship where she was kind of under the weather. Um, had a disappointing year. It was nice to see her bounce back in her training and, you know, really race all through the regular season meets, um, push her limits. And, you know, she'd never been 106 before. So to go from a high 106, which wasn't a best time in prelims, to a 104 um, was just an incredible swim in that 100 breaststroke. She was just off a B cut. Um, swam lights out, probably one of the best swims of the entire meet. Um, and then her 200 breaststroke um, had been a little shakier this season. Um, but after her prelim swim, I knew she'd be, you know, right up there and have another great swim. And she takes home two titles. So Nietzsche with three titles, Weinberger with two titles. Perhaps the biggest surprise for me when I looked at these results, Luke Holloway, the 100 free, breaking a 32-year-old school record. Where, were you expecting that result going into the weekend? Yeah, Luke's had a phenomenal meet. Um, we knew he'd be competitive in both the 200 and the 100 for, for conference titles. Um, coming out of high school, Luke was just really raw, athletic guy, um, hadn't done a lot of training. So we knew once we got some, some increased yardage under his belt that he'd start to see some really great results. Um, and then after his 200, where he was the runner up, um, I think the hundred is kind of Luke's best distance in there between the hundred and 200. And, you know, he's only going to continue to improve, but we saw how the prelims went and he had the hundred IM that day too, which was a hard double. So he went hundred IM a couple events break, and then he was back in the hundred free and earned the seven seed in the 100 IM and was the two seed in the 100 free. Um, so we talked after prelims and decided, for those listeners that don't know much about swimming, the top eight spots are locked after prelims, mm -hmm. and then the top 16 are also. So even if you are um, ninth, but you go the second fastest time in the whole meet and finals, it doesn't matter. You can't go better than ninth because you didn't make that top eight heat in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, so with Luke being seventh, we thought he might – be able to move up to around fifth or sixth but he could also be seventh or eighth again so we decided to have him take that 100 im easy just take the eighth place get the points there because we knew he couldn't do any worse and to really focus on winning the 100 free and that gamble paid off and paid off um he had a had a much faster first 50 but even that put him at sixth place at the 50 mark and then just brought it back way stronger than the rest of the field and was able to finish with the win so definitely really exciting and i think just scratching the surface of what things are to come for him. A uh, first year winning a conference championship. Uh, last week when we talked to, to Macy and Christian before the championships, uh, they both highlighted they wanted to do well in the relays. All sorts of school records fell. What did you make a, of your respective relay teams and, and their efforts over the weekend? Yeah, on the men's side, this is the first year we've really had, you know, upper championship competitor athletes to pair with Christian. Sure. So having Luke, someone who is competitive for conference titles, having Anthony, who's, you know, making the A final in the backstroke events and Brady, who's, you know, just out of the A final in the butterfly events really helped our push our medleys over the edge this year and help them get under those. And then in the freestyle events, we, again, Luke really stepped up Christian dropped time in that a free relay, um, freshman Sawyer Conklin, who came in as around a two minutes in the, um, 200 free I ended up dropping close to 10 seconds by the end of the year and Anthony was in that same boat had a 15 second drop Luke 15 second drop in that event so just people consistently dropping time and, and becoming competitive really helped push those relays over the edge this year and then on the women's side we had kind of the same core we've had the last few years but everybody was just a little bit faster this year and helped us get under those marks we hadn't been before and for the women's 800 free relay this is the first time we've really gone strong in that relay at a championship meet so um, having Macy lead off with the near school record set the tone, and then everybody else just followed. Uh, another great job by the relay team setting all sorts of records. What went into this year that separated this group from, from any other Frostburg team that you've had before? Uh, the biggest thing was just the depth, having people to push each other every day in practice so that you know it wasn't necessarily just Macy or Christian kind of swimming on their own each day and 
having to push themselves, but having freshmen like Luke and Brady and Scott and Sawyer step up and you know help push Christian each day, and having those guys help push Macy each day too. Um, and then our middle tier group was just much stronger than we've ever been, and you know having having that kind of competitiveness and that speed every day in practice really helped push the whole group throughout the entire season to where we got. How are you going to rem- how are you going to remember this team? Um, you know, all this was probably my my favorite and best championship meet we've had, just top to bottom. Everybody swam so well. The energy was so good all weekend. Um, and I'll probably remember it most as you know, this was the first group of my fresh freshmen I recruited graduating, and and just the leadership that they brought, and and how that's trickled down and impacted the rest of the team, and hopefully impacts this program, you know, for years ahead and helps them continue that success. Well, it's been a fun year, a great way to end the year. Uh, thank you so much for coming in the day after as the bus came in late last night uh, to join us on the Bobcast. Thanks, Coach. Thanks. Up next in the Bobcast, we have Frostburg baseball head coach Guy Robertson in baseball, 6-1 and one overall, 3-0 and oh this past weekend. And, and, Coach, we talked two weeks ago preseason and uh, the numbers your team has are awesome. 11 runs a game, a, a 3.05 ERA as a team. But uh, two weeks ago, we talked a lot about chemistry, hallmarks of, of Frostburg baseball, toughness, grittiness, hard nosedness, playing with energy. Have you seen that from your team in these past two weekends? Yeah, absolutely. I think that we've really seen the chemistry piece. There's totally a different feel in our dugout. Um, around the ball club and uh, at the ballpark when we get there and there a lot more attention to detail. Uh, one of the guys said the other day that they had noticed that we had uh, been getting to the ballpark a little bit earlier than usual, uh, or at least than we had last year. Um, that was definitely something that, you know, we wanted to get to the ballpark so we could get focused uh-huh. on the task at hand, let guys kind of just get in the zone and, and get relaxed and kind of get focused on what we're trying to accomplish that particular day. Um, and as far as like the toughness and the grittiness, uh, you know, Last, uh, I guess, two weekends ago now, the opening weekend, we we played Stevenson and we get blown out and we played very poorly. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think when we were going to the weekend, you know, you'd love to go 4-0, but I thought, you know, hey, if we could get out of here 3-1, that would be fantastic. And there we sat after three games, 2-1, with playing Stevenson again on Sunday. And uh, the grittiness and the toughness came out. Uh, We played a a very well-rounded ball game. Um, against a good team who really had our number the day before. And, and certainly, um, if you go back to last year, um, we kind of had some knockdown, drag-out fights uh, to the 2017 season. So, um, you know, you, you hoped it for the best coming in there on Sunday, and then then we got it. Uh, we got a very, very well-pitched ball game out of Logan Corgan, and he threw probably the best he has in a Bobcat uniform. Um, and then Brady Adam came in and, um, you know, did some more good things. And uh, Michael Livingston was able to uh, get the job done at the end there. So I think that toughness, um, grittiness really came out that Sunday where you kind of gathered yourself and came back and played a game that was more uh, representative of what, you know, we think we're about um, against a good team who certainly was uh, energized against us the day before and um, has a new coach. So I think they came in with a renewed uh, energy and, and outlook. So, yeah, over the last two weekends, it's been uh, it's been fun to be around the ballpark. It's been nice to be outside, really good weather. I think that always helps. And um, kind of accomplishing some of the things that we'd hoped to accomplish over the course, of, you know, at this point in time. Um, and I think any time you can start the season, again, no matter who you play against, um, kind of how we have, it's been nice. Are you even surprised by how strong of a start it is considering the, the lack of time that you've had outside uh, here in Frostburg? Yes and no. I think every year when you have a new group of guys, and we certainly with 16 new guys, you never know how they're going to respond to kind of having to come out, out of the gym, take the field and play games. Um, but I felt like with the recruiting class that we had, we had a group that was capable of doing what we've done um, to be able to deal with the adverse weather and, and um, you know, prepare themselves physically and mentally to go out and compete and, um, you know, two weekends in and um, we've been able to do that. Um, maybe not as much last year and um, certainly that was something, you know, that we need to look at. But over the last, I would say, seven, eight seasons, we've been capable of coming out of the gym and being able to, to take care of business. Um, but that's a tribute to the type of athletes that we have, um, the type of ball players that we have. And I, and I certainly feel uh, strongly about this group as well. 
we can't talk w- about your team without talking about Greg Schneider, who has all American numbers through the first few weeks of the season. One earned in 13 innings, 30 strikeouts. Um, he is on from from the word go. Are, are you surprised at all by by that level of production from the very beginning? No. Um, you know, I think when we talked about him, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you looked at the overall numbers over the course of three seasons and you see one of the best pitchers in the history of mm-hmm. division three baseball. And you're certainly seeing that in his senior year. Um, he's come out with a different focus and a different, uh, little bit of a chip on his shoulder. I think he feels like, you know, that he's got something to prove and he's certainly going to take the advantage of this last opportunity he has to play college baseball and try to propel himself to a professional career. In the meantime, he's going to have every career record probably pitching-wise and, you know, maybe the CAC has to offer certainly probably what uh, we at Frostburg State have to offer. He's the active strikeout leader in Division Three right now. Well, and, and, you know, we were looking at some of the, the numbers. Coach Miller was breaking down some of the numbers after, the you know, the 15 strikeout performance, um, you know, back-to-back weeks. And um, I, I think, you know, you just look at some of the things. Not only he set the tone, um, but just what – kind of the rest of the guys have kind of you know risen to the occasion as well I think we were looking and there's like seven or nine 20 strikeout games in the history of division three baseball and of course in a nine inning regulation ball game mm-hmm. and we have two of them in two weekends so um, certainly not just Greg but the entire pitching staff has been relatively dominant um, and that's certainly exactly the recipe for success that you want to have um, especially early, but that's got to be something that's got to carry us. I think any b- good ball club is going to ha- start with what happens on the mound, um, and we've certainly got that in the first two weekends of the season. Not just Snyder, uh, Brady Adam also 2-0, and one earned in 9.2 innings, 22 Ks himself. What has he shown in his first two outings as a Bobcat? Well, exactly what, we, what we'd what we hoped when we brought him here. Um, he's an intense competitor. Um, he has – complete control command of what he's trying to accomplish on the mound he understands that he's got you know above this level capabilities um and he is supremely confident and um you know in some ways um on friday i mean we we didn't play against a particularly uh talented ball club well it's a new New, program new rochelle new program um and he he was just toying with some of their hitters uh, with some of the stuff that he was doing so um, he's very gifted, and uh, we're very fortunate to have him. And um, to pair him with Greg um, certainly looks like it's going to be a one-two punch to be reckoned with. Um, but uh, it's exciting to see it come together a little bit. And, um, you know, not just those guys, but we've seen a lot more out of Trent Eric over the last couple weekends. Um, has been just worked his tail off over the last year coming off a, a you know, below average uh, subpar season last year and you really see him uh, bearing some of the fruits of his labor um, the time and energy that he's put in and it's fun to see and uh, we're excited about again what Mike Livingston can bring to the table and he accomplished some things Uh, it was good to see Marco get back out there um, and throw the three innings that he threw just to kind of write himself from you know just a just a shaky uh, you know outing uh, the, the previous weekend but um, it, it was good to see some guys get back out there and, and, and do some different things and not just be, you know, look at it and say, hey, you know, Greg and Brady, you got to carry the load. Uh, we don't want that. Uh, it seemed like that was the only chance we ever had to win last year was uh, if Greg was on the mound and we didn't give him a lot of run support. Um, it, it's nice to have a lot of other guys that we feel are capable of contributing at a high level. Uh, Greg has certainly set the tone, and, and Brady, no question, that wants to, uh, you know, equal or better him. Um, what's going on. So it's fun to watch them compete against themselves over the last two weeks. Um, but it's certainly also fun to watch a lot of the rest of the, the pitching staff members elevate their game as well. Yeah, Schneider and, and Adam, those are all American caliber numbers. And then you've got eight other pitchers who have thrown at least three innings. So uh, the 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 height and the depth of the staff, really. Well, one of the things that we thought was pretty neat, um, out of the first weekend you play four games, we used every single pitcher on our pitching staff that was a, uh, was available. We were one short because we had a guy with injury, um, and we didn't use a single guy twice. Um, so to get everybody out there and kind of uh, break the ice a little bit uh, was really nice the first weekend. Uh, you know, it, we didn't get as many guys on the mound maybe as we would have liked this past weekend. You never know that you're going to you know go out there and use two guys for 13 total innings uh, of your 27. So. Um, and then, you know, the score dictated that at least in the first game you weren't going to use, um, mm-hmm. well, the first two games situation, you really weren't going to use a whole lot of guys after that. And then uh, we did the best we could to try to piece some things together yesterday. 
Um, but it was nice to, to get uh, multiple guys out there on the mound and, and uh, get them some opportunities and see them be successful is even better. Shifting gears to the lineup, I, I, I think it's really funny. You see your whole lineup. Manny Colon bats ninth for you guys. He's at the end of the order, and he has five multi-hit games, and he's tied for the team lead in, in RBI. What can you speak to the balance of your lineup and how productive they've been this year? Well, first, it's funny to hear you call him Manny. I like that. I'm, it, the nickname is definitely stuck. Mm -hmm. Nobody even knows his name is Evan Colon anymore, uh, which is kind of neat. Um, listen, total testament to a guy who's persevered, um, didn't play a whole lot his first two years, um, you know, was a part-time starter last year as a junior, um, just – and really – was probably only that because Devin Bell was hurt all year and, and you know, got some opportunities because of that. But he's just stuck it out. He's kept working. He's a guy that's constantly been in the cage over his four years. You go down there and you see him hitting on the tee by himself all the time. Um, and you just – you really appreciate um, a guy that is just – driven and motivated and wants to be successful whatever the the level or the, whatever the highest level he can get to he's trying to get there um and reach his potential um and he's just been a, a steadying force this year and you're just seeing him um you know it's just fun to see a guy that's put that much time and energy and effort in and, and to get the results that he's gotten um and yeah it's you know he's you know he's by far leading our team in home runs um, right there in RBIs, and, and I think, yeah, yeah, he's batted ninth, and that's been a good spot for him to turn the lineup over. He, he had a huge home run yesterday to get us going. I mean, we were kind of just stagnant for the first few mm -hmm. innings, and I think, you know, we're taking some things for granted, and it was an early, early start, you know, at 11 a.m., and he hits a home run, and things kind of get going, and it's fun. It's been fun to watch, and, um, you know, sometimes uh, you, you look for seniors to step up, and you would have thought that it would have come from this guy, but, you know, it would have been bogey or burger, uh, Boz, you know, Schneider, those guys, um, all, all these seniors that we have. But it's the guy at the bottom of the lineup that's uh, triggered a lot of good things for us. So I'm happy for him and certainly want to help, you know, hopeful that he keeps it rolling. Um, and then, uh, but, you know, the, like you said, the lineup's been good from yeah. the top to bottom. I mean, we're averaging 11 runs a game, which, you know, 10 yesterday dropped us from 12. Um, certainly, if you could have thought through seven games that you'd average 11 runs a game, we'd take that every single time, especially with the pitching that we've gotten. But, um, it's been fun. We've gotten a, a bunch of really timely hits. If you look back, some things with two outs over the course of the first two weekends that, that have, you know, either it's been to, you know key RBIs or it's to, to extend the lead, attack on run, a lot of two out uh, base hits and things like that, extra base hits that have really propelled us offensively. Um, and it's come from a bunch of different guys. So uh, that's been it's been fun to see. And when we built this team, we felt like we could have a deep lineup and be able to you know put some guys in, take some guys out. I mean, Logan Corrigan's another guy. Um, you know, he he hadn't started every game. We've been trying to balance it between him pitching and him hitting. And uh, we're able to DH him the first two days because he wasn't pitching until yesterday. Hits a huge two-run home run for us that mm -hmm. can really extends the lead from four to six. And, you know, you feel like, all right, well, four is closer. But six, when it got to six, it really kind of felt like it was a little out of reach considering what, yeah. what Newark was doing offensively. So, um, but again, you know, we've we've gotten big hits from a bunch of different people in a bunch of different spots, um, and that's certainly what you want from your lineup. You can get it from any anywhere, one of, or any one of the nine guys that are in it at any particular time. This weekend, you're in Owings Mills to play Stevenson, Keystone, and Cortland, which uh, bar none will be your toughest competition through this point in the season. Uh, what what do you want to learn from your team, and what do you expect uh, from your team this weekend? Well, I, I was talked to some people over the last day and you know it this is the time where you need to see your ball club step forward and step up uh, there's no question in my mind that this is a ball club capable of competing on the national stage um, if we stay healthy and we continue to prepare ourselves and we pay attention to the little things like we have over the first well I guess it's been four weeks four and a half weeks now um, we've had a lot of really good practices and certainly we've seen that translate over into game, game success. Um, but it's going to be a little bit different this weekend. I mean, we've had Cortland on the schedule for one reason or another over the past three years, I guess, um, and we haven't beat them yet. And they're typically a top five team in the country, mm -hmm. you know, 13 World Series or 14 or whatever. Um, I don't want to put all our focus on just that one ball club. Keystone's gotten off to a slow start. Uh, but they're a very formidable opponent. Played in the national championship game two years ago, um, and have been a national power and have a lot of a lot of good players. 
Um, and then Stevenson, you know, back with them for the third time. They're your one player. loss. Yeah. So, you know, there, there's a lot to be proven. Um, but we have the capability of playing and competing and beating these these caliber teams. Um, we're going to have them over the next couple of weeks when we get Shenandoah in a couple of weeks as well, and, you know, certainly into the conference. But um, it's going to be fun. I'm excited about it. Um, hopefully we get good weather. You get a chance to go down and you play in a regional-type atmosphere at a couple different sites and bounce around and um, just, just play really good ball clubs. And um, we've had some good success in this tournament, uh, but it hasn't necessarily been against – these teams that we beat Keystone a couple of years ago um, in this tournament, and that was the only time we played them. Uh, but, to, you know, to be able to face the, Cortland is always fun. Um, you never would con- think about playing them on a consistent basis with where we're located, where they're located. Uh, but we just keep running into them, and, um, you know, it, it's kind of – I feel like it's a feather in this program's cap that – um, you know, we keep running into teams like that. Um, and, and I think that, you know, any time that you mention a, a Keystone, a Cortland, a Shenandoah, a Salisbury, you, you name it, the teams that have been national powers over the, you know, long haul here, uh, at least over the last decade. Um, and you, you'd be able to mention our name in there as well um, on a relatively consistent basis, I think is, is just um, – just a feather in our cap and it's um you know nice for the players to have that recognition and um but you get you, in order to keep getting mentioned in those same breath as those clubs you got to go out and beat them and mm-hmm. um you know we certainly want to take care of business this weekend um not overlooking stevenson on friday by any means um but it'll be a fun weekend and uh anytime you get to play against the best teams in the country you know that's something you should look forward yeah. to and uh certainly this weekend is uh, no different We're looking forward to it as well. Guy Robertson, thank you so much for your time and joining us in the Bobcast. My pleasure. Next in the Bobcast, we have women's lacrosse and head coach Haley Weir. And uh, women's lacrosse, season opener against Randolph-Macon, a 21-14 loss. But Randolph-Macon, a a strong team. They're picked to finish second in the ODAC. Uh, Frostburg was up 8-6 with seven and a half minutes to play in the first half. How did you get to that point uh, controlling the game early on? So we had a very specific game plan of what we wanted to work on going into the game, and I think that our girls executed it perfectly. Um, we It was a very tight game the entire time until the end, and I think that the score doesn't really reflect how well that we played and exactly what we needed to do. We covered, um, so we're excited to kind of move on from this and put that little loss behind us, and this week we have a big week coming up, and I think if we can continue that game plan that we went in there with, I think it'll be great. Uh, can you... Speak specifically to the game plan or the approach that you had to, to this Randolph-Macon game or even to this team, to the season. What What is your team trying to do? So our biggest um, goal this year is to make it back to the CAC playoffs, and we like to challenge ourselves with some of these games like Randolph-Macon because they're so competitive in the ODAC. I think that it helps to start our season off on that note to give our girls kind of a heads up of what's coming. And so I think that – It's always positive regardless of the score just because it's a competitive game and it gets our girls kind of in that mindset of we need to step up and we need to follow the game plan. And with our game plan, we really took some time this week to figure out our strengths. Um, Like we mentioned last week, we have 10 new freshmen. Mm -hmm. Um, So we had a lot of new starters that this was their first collegiate game and Sometimes the nerves take over, and we just wanted to make them as prepared as possible. So we moved some people around, and we tried to work the best that we could to um, highlight our strengths. And so I think that all over the field, from our defense that we ran to our midfield into a sum of attacking plays that we came up with just for this game. I think that a lot of them really worked well and our girls were able to execute them. You already got on to one of my next questions. Ten new players. You graduated a large and productive senior class. How did your newcomers fare and and how did the returners step up and in what ways did they do so? Um, Jess Hartley was huge for us. So she um, is a junior slash senior um, and she Um, has played defense for us. She was a transfer and has played defense for us, and we moved her to take the draw this week, and she did phenomenal with nine draw controls. Mm -hmm. Um, She ended up getting hurt, and we had to take her to the hospital um, in the middle of the game, so some of that momentum really slowed our team down. Um, But I think that she did phenomenal, and she's excited to be back, and she's fine, by the way, and healthy, (laughs) and everything um, is ready to go. So she's excited to be back this week and to still continue to take those draws for us. So that was a huge returner for us. Um, Also, Abby and Emily in the goal, they split halves, um, and I think that they both did great 
like we said, Randolph Macon has a couple girls on attack that we knew were going to be big threats, and they were. And I think Abby and Emily had some huge saves that really helped. Um, and it was exciting to kind of see them in action. And then some of our newcomers, I think, were all over the field. We started a ton of them, and I think that they all just stepped up in ways that they could. Um, Steph on attack, Stephanie King, she had a goal and two assists, and to kind of be that confident in there, and she's coming off an ACL. Um, repair so I think that she really stepped up a lot and helped our attack and helped Morgan kind of continue with her leading role down there so that was exciting. Offensively you were led by Morgan Cavey six goals what did you make of her first game of the season and, and how does she have to adjust her game as, as the top returner from last year? Um, that's the expectation that we have for Morgan. I think that she also sets for herself. So six for us was a new career high for her, but for us, that's pretty normal of where we would like her to be in that four to eight range, any game. Sure. Um, and I think that she's ready to take that role. I think that last year was, um, a step in the right direction. I think she kind of hit her point of this is my time now and I'm ready. And so she really stepped up and six was pretty good. She was fighting all the way, ready to go. Um, and I think she just realizes now that she's got to figure out how she fits in with this attack because they are all new and how she can kind of figure some things out. Last year, it was kind of Morgan and Nikki, um, running the two-man game a lot and doing a lot of specific stuff together and so now to kind of find someone that she gels with back there is is just what we've been working on at practice and I think it really showed this week. Last week you mentioned that the the whole midfield is new or new to that position. How did that unit fare? Um, I think they did pretty well for what we were trying to accomplish with just, like I said, nine. That's huge. Um, we put Summer Cavey, who's a freshman, on the midfield, and we also had Sam Cataldo, who's a senior, who has played defense, and we asked her to step up and play midfield this game, and she did great. Um, we had some other subs that we ran in and out. Um, Courtney Reidenauer, she's a senior, and she did phenomenal running um, for the midfield and attack for us. And Lindsay Coleman was another one that um, is a freshman, and so she stepped up and was ready to go. It was like she'd been here for forever. This game featured a couple of scoring runs for, for Randolph Macon. Where did things sort of go left for your team, and, and what can you sort of learn from, from this game and against this competition? So we had a stretch in the game where we lost, I think, four or five draw controls in a row. And we were just about to switch things up and to have Summer step in to take the draw and kind of just give Jess a break for a minute. She had been running the entire game. And mm -hmm. um, as soon as we did that, they Jess, that's when Jess went down. And so to get her off the field was a good 15, 20 minutes. And I think our team was just worried and wanted to know what was happening. And then we just lost our momentum and sure. couldn't really come back out of that hole that we had dug. So, Sort of some extenuating circumstances there mm -hmm. affecting the game. Uh, what What is the benefit of playing such a strong program to open your season? And coming out of this game, what are you working on as you gear up for a, a really busy week? So I think, like I mentioned earlier, the CAC is just so strong. And so to try to find teams that we can play out of the CAC that are within driving distance and yeah. that we can really help our team kind of get ready for the CAC is what we look for in our strength of schedule there. Um, so opening up with we scrimmaged against Washington College and mm -hmm. then to open up our first game against Randolph-Macon is just – that was exactly what we needed. It was kind of a shell shock of this is what we're getting into, head first into the season, and let's go ready to go and see what happens. And so I think that that was a positive for opening up like that. Like I said, even though the score didn't turn out exactly how we wanted it to. Um, this week we have three more games, so and they all should be pretty competitive. Um, we're playing some new teams that we haven't played and a couple that we just added onto the schedule. So we're excited to kind of continue that momentum. And if we can keep the – togetherness that we played with on Saturday. I think that this week should be great for us. This week it's at West Virginia Wesleyan on Tuesday, at Washington and Jefferson on Thursday, and then hosting Susquehanna on Saturday. Lots of lacrosse. What would you like to see from your team in this next week? I think if we can keep that high intensity competitiveness that we played with on Saturday. I think going into all three of these games, we should come out on top. I think that they are excited now and kind of a little frustrated that the score didn't turn out how we wanted it to. And so if we can turn that around and use it and kind of move forward game by game and focus each one at a time, I think that we can chip away and come out on top this week. Haley Weir, thank you so much for joining us in the Bobcast. Thank you. Next in the Bobcast, we have men's lacrosse head coach Tommy Pierce. Men's lacrosse, a tough loss 
to number 11 ranked Franklin and Marshall on the road 20 to 9 this past weekend. The game was tied at 2 after the first quarter. However, FNM went on to score seven consecutive goals in the second quarter, leading 10-3 at half. The the closest Frostburg got in the second half was 7 points, 14-7. Uh, Coach, what went well in the first quarter where it was tied 2-2, and and how did Franklin and Marshall pull away afterwards? Uh, I think the first quarter was a lot of settled uh, half field, um, so we were able to get some long defensive stands, get some saves. Um, they they kind of adjusted their offense a little bit after the first quarter uh, because I think we were doing a pretty good job against their, their big little behind. Um, and we had some, you know, when we got the ball in the offensive end, we, we had some some possessions where we took some time off the clock. I think that uh, after the first quarter, they really got going in transition, and our uh, transition defense was really poor. So that's something where, you know, I'm going to address first thing today. That that was one of my, my next questions. Several goals against a, an unsettled defense. Mm-hmm. How were they effective in generating those chances and then converting on them? Uh, they go fast, for sure, you know, from, from one end to the other. They, they keep everybody on the field and, and, and send everybody deep. And, you know, they're, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're actually going into the game. We kind of, you know, in the scouting report told guys that their, their long stick midi from last year and their two returning short stick D midis actually had more points in their second midfield line. So, I mean, that's a big part of what they do and what they want to get. And uh, I think we did a, just an okay job of getting in the hole. But what we did a really, really bad job of is, you know, once we got back in defense, you know, having some urgency with matching up and we just didn't, didn't pick them up well enough, and, and, and they were you know they were attacking the goal hard, and, and we kind of just we didn't have everybody covered pretty pretty simply, you know, unfortunately. So uh, a little disappointing for sure. You know, we thought we'd address that in practice last week, but you know, clearly not well enough. Well, Franklin and Marshall comes into the season. You said it last week. I've I've read on different publications. You know, D three wise, F and M is one of the top attacking units in all of Division Three coming into this year. If you guys give them a little bit of space there, uh, they were able to convert, and, and they converted on some tough goals. You know. They did, yes. Their coach kind of mentioned that they, they thought they had a great day shooting. You know, and I think that a lot of the goals that they were scoring were, were right off you know, goal line extended, turning the corner mm-hmm. from behind, and some pretty low angle shots that, um, you know, I think we tried to adjust and, and slide a little bit quicker. Um, but, you know, they'd already gotten their fair share of goals at that point. So, Offensively, nine goals, four were assisted compared to eight assisted goals uh, on nine total goals. How did that unit fare on, on Saturday in your perspective? Um, you know, after games, I always go in and kind of do like an off- offensive efficiency chart, and I, and uh, we're still waiting for that film to get broke down for me to make that chart. Um, you know, I, I I think that we didn't get as many possessions as we would have liked. I think statistically, it looks like we did okay on faceoffs and okay on clears, but I think a lot of those times we you know we won a faceoff, but then we didn't get an offensive possession out mm-hmm. of it because we turned it over or. You know, we, we cleared the ball technically by, you know, satisfying the clear clock by stepping it in the box, but uh, we turned it over shortly after that. So I think that, um, you know, we definitely could have given our offensive guys a few more possessions. Um, you know, I, I think pretty good on man up. I think we scored uh, three man up goals. So mm-hmm. so of those nine goals, you know, only six of them were in, in, in settled six on six, but I would have liked to have had a few more possessions on offense for sure. Uh, can you define offensive efficiency for me? I'm I'm a novice when it comes to lacrosse. What goes into that, that just, chart? Uh, what do you look at? You know, when we look at settled six on six opportunities, how many of those we're scoring on? You know, what what percentage of our six on six opportunities are, are resulting in goals? Uh, you know, what what percentage of them, if they're not resulting in goals, uh, we think we took quality shots. You know, and then what percentage of them are, you know, we're, we're not just not quality possessions? You know, what, kind of what went wrong? So that's, that's what we do. Uh, you know, with our offensive film stuff after every game. So waiting waiting for a crossover to get that film broken down so we can get that to the guys here today soon. In the face-off game, F&M an 11-4 edge in the first half. It ended up being just plus two F&M, 16-14. Uh, what did you think of that unit on Saturday? You know, I think our face-off guys, uh, you know, Sam Natvig's still not playing lacrosse, mm-hmm. who we thought was going to be our top face-off guy this year. Unfortunately, he's still dealing with some back problems. Um, you know, but we think Drew Mash and um, – uh, Matt Pagliaro are getting in there and, and scrapping. You know, we think our wing guys are coming off uh, the wings and playing hard and, and, and trying to kind of, you know, if it's not clean, that we can maybe win some faceoffs ugly too. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that they're, they're fighting, you know, and, and, and we're getting a little bit better in practice. Um, you know, so I think that we were concerned that our faceoffs might be more of an issue as far as our ability to win and lose games. And I think that those guys are, are, are doing well enough that that's not the reason why. You know, there, there's some other reasons right now. 
Well, what what can you learn from from this game? You you guys have beaten a ranked team three years in a row. You've got four currently ranked teams still in the schedule, plus E Town, who was in in the tournament last year. What can you learn from this great game, and and how do you regroup? Sure, you know I think what I always tell the guys after a game is that I'm I'm going to go back and watch the film, so I don't want to say too much. Sure. Uh, but I didn't need to watch the film to know that we were really, really bad in transition defense, you know, kind of horribly bad. Uh, so, you know, we, we, I met with my assistants yesterday and kind of said, you know, given the amount of time that we have to practice between now and a game on Wednesday, uh -huh. how much time of it is allotted to this and, and how are we going to address it? You know, what are we telling the guys and how are we practicing it? How are we repping it out? And, uh, you know, we need to, we know we need to get better there. We think we can do a lot, a lot better, um, you know, picking up ground balls on the defensive end and getting clears um, you know, after we win a face-off, getting offensive possessions. And then I think we really forced the issue kind of in our, in our substitution offense that led to some turnovers where I think we need to be a little bit smarter sometimes and you know when to push it and when not to. Um, uh, that's another way that we lost some six-on-six -six possessions on Saturday. Finally, this week, uh, Lebanon Valley on Wednesday, quick turnaround, and then Washington at Washington on Saturday. A win over Leb Val last year, a loss to Washington. What are you looking for out of your group this week? You know, what we kind of said after the game is that, you know, the, Right now, we're one on one with 15 games left to play. Yes, you know what I mean. So it's a 17 game season, and uh, you know we don't want our highs to be too high and our lows to be too low. It's a long season, and we need to kind of you know walk the line, and um, you know we need to get better by Wednesday. And then uh, you know I think Washington College is, is is a great team. It's a you know um, uh, you know kind of a long bus ride. You get get off the bus, yes. and be ready to play down there. So um, you know we're just kind of telling the guys that you know, we got two games down you know with with the one loss to the, a really good team uh 15 games left to play and we need to you know ad address our issues and and fix them as fast and and be ready to go wednesday so you know we we lift on monday so all those guys were there lifting working hard and uh you know told them that we we're going to practice hard at 6 p.m and, and get better Hey, we're looking forward to it. Leb Val on Wednesday. You can watch it on the Bobcat Sports Network at Washington on Saturday. Tommy Pierce, thank you for joining us in the Bobcast. Thank you. Making his debut on the Bobcast is men's and women's head coach Aaron Wilf in his second season here at Frostburg State. In the first season, coach helped the men double its win total from the previous year and the women to triple, more than triple their win total from the 15-16 season. So 11 combined wins, men's and women's. And coach, before we get into this season, what, what has the tennis team been up to since the end of last season how does a program progress from by the time the season ends until it starts up again what have you guys been doing well right now it's just been a lot more time on the court I think every day just a chance to get out there hit a lot more tennis balls we're trying to do that uh, rain or shine hopefully more uh, shine than rain but uh, when we can't get outside we've been inside in the gym working hard strength and conditioning is going well as well so um, any chance we have a you know opportunity to get out there and hit we're trying to hit and uh team's looking really good right now when you took this position you knew that uh certain times of the year it would be more difficult to to get outside uh to practice how important is the outside practice time and specifically how do you spend your in time inside practice time and what are you doing uh, like I was saying, inside's a lot of strength and conditioning. Um, we set up the nets in the in the main arena, in the main gym, which has been going well. But uh, outside, we obviously have the luxury of six courts compared to two courts inside. So going outside allows us a lot more time for match play, uh, tournament matches, things like that, to kind of see where we are as a team, mostly in singles. But um, it lets us spread out a little bit more. So we always hope to go outside. Uh, it's been great for us so far. We've had some really good days here in February weather-wise. We love that. We hope for a lot more. But um, like I said, we're doing everything we can do, and uh, every day is a chance to get better. Uh, a couple days in, in the 70s last week here in Frostburg. Uh, when, when you came to Frostburg last year and in, in, in coaching again this year, what is your tennis philosophy per se? What characteristics of, of playing the game are you looking for You know, every player on your team to have uh, and carry with them throughout the season and, and in their careers? I think it's just one of those uh, hardworking, blue-collar uh, commitment to the team, and uh, that's what we're about. Um, we're not a nationally ranked program at this point. We're, uh, you know, I think we're bottom half of the conference, but like I said, every day we're looking to get better, looking to improve. Uh, that's what we're preaching to our team. We want good character people, good character student athletes, kids that show up early, leave late, work hard, put the time in, and uh, we think if we continue to get that commitment, 
then over time we are going to be closing in on the top half of this conference. How, how have you seen the program evolve in, in terms of, of that commitment from your players from, say, your last year to this year? I think it has been strength and conditioning. I think it's been a lot sure. of uh, commitment off the court as well as on the court. And uh, it, it really all starts with the coaches. It starts with us bringing in kids that buy into our system, our belief structure. I think we're doing that. Um, a lot of recruiting. We have some recruits coming in next year. Uh, we've already started 2019, you know, 2020. So it's really just – you know, always trying to get kids that buy into what we're selling, our system, what we're about, the rolling up the sleeves, going to work, kind of like I said, blue collar mentality. If we can find that and consistently bring in those kids to the program, we know we have some really good times ahead. Talking to men's and women's tennis head coach Aaron Wolf, uh, this is interesting to me to ask this question for a bunch of different sports. What is leadership in tennis, and uh, how is it shown on your team, especially considering I, I believe it's just one senior on the two teams? What is leadership in tennis, and, and how has that been shown on your squads? We, we are very, very lucky to have two incredible captains, and I think they really paved the way in terms of what we believe leadership is. Uh, on the men's side, we have Abby Alojo, and he has just done an incredible job of just rallying the troops. Um, he just, you know, always, always on the court, you know, giving high fives and shouting encouragement and just always being around. I think especially with the younger players, they really respond well to him. And, uh, yeah, he has just been great for the men's team. Uh, sophomore Allison Paul has just been incredible on the women's side. Um, again, shows up early, leaves late. Her commitment to the team, all the girls look to her um, as a leader. And, again, both on and off the court, she carries a 4.0 GPA. So she's really someone that um, all of our student athletes can look up to. So just having Abby and Allison have truly been a blessing uh, for the tennis program here at Frostburg. Let's dive into the nitty gritty a little bit here. Looking at last season to this season, where where are you looking for for the biggest improvement from your team, or can can you define what success this season is for your team? What are you looking for out of the year? You know, it's I, I've been asked that before. I I really try not to look at success in terms of just wins and losses. Yeah. I think there's lots of ways to measure success um you know again it's it's really a kind of a young team on the guys side i think also pretty much a young team on the women's side so i think it's just about making progress um we had one win on the women's side in the cac looking to bump that up you know maybe two three four and we're just trying to see how we can do that in the cac this year um just put together good strings of matches i think that's huge for us on the guys side um we were you know we didn't have any wins in conference play last year so i think kind of scratching and calling and try to get in that first win i think in conference is going to be big for us i think it's very achievable so um again not really a, a, a just the wins and losses kind of guy but i think if we start to see more commitment more time on the court uh, more belief and being able to recruit and bring in better student athletes to this school um, all those things combined well everything off the court good character kids i think that all translates into success uh, as a program I want to take a look at the women here for a moment. Last year, quite a bit of success in, in some of the later singles flights as well as in, in your doubles. How, how much of an emphasis is it to, to have some depth on your tennis team and also uh, bring and look to win at least two out of three in the doubles side each match? Uh, always huge to win two or three in the doubles. Uh, I, you know, I don't know exactly what the percentages are. I know when teams go down 0-3 in the doubles, it is very, very hard oh, to, yes. to squeak out a win. So very, very tough to start strong, kind of uh, throw that first punch, uh, if you will, in the doubles and really try to get a 2-1 two, two lead. Yeah, singles is huge. Singles is huge. It's really just about uh, leaning on success in the doubles, wear them down, and really try to uh, take it to them in the singles, which uh, you know, I, I think especially on the women's side, we showed we can do that last year. How important was uh, the consistency with your doubles teams, uh, especially on the women's side, to the success that they had, especially at, at two and three doubles with uh, uh, Allison and Emma and then Jenna and uh, Sammy as well? Yeah, a lot of success. I thought we had some good chemistry last year. It's something we're working on right now going into this year. We did lose a few players from last year. So, yeah, doubles is all about chemistry. Uh, we have four kind of core players that have returned from last season. Uh, Kate Paler, Jenna Lipinski, Sammy Turner, Allison Paul. And uh, we're not exactly sure where everyone's going to fall in terms of one through three in the doubles order. 
but uh, we're going to really lean hard on those four. We added a couple uh, new additions to the women's team, so uh, that's why we're out there every day on the court and we're trying to figure it out. I think we're getting pretty close to uh, where we'd like to have everyone. I don't know, uh, you know how many secrets I want to divulge right now, uh -huh. but uh, I, I think we're getting close to uh, figuring out kind of everyone's doubles uh, order. Can you see... Uh, sticking with the women's side, can you see the, the progression from year to year for, for those four, Lipinski, Paul, Paler, and, and Turner, and, and how have they looked so far in the preseason? Uh, huge progression. Uh, awesome. th there, there's been maturity, not just on the court, off the court, just as individuals, just, just as people. You know, we've seen growth. We've seen, like I said, maturity. Uh, you know, Kate at the top, just, you know, just always, always, you know, competitive, um, blue collar, goes to work, hates to lose. We just love having that mentality. Jenna is just, just a consummate student athlete. We just love having her on the team. Like I said, Allison, the captain, we know what we're going to get with her every day. Um, Sammy in the doubles is starting to do some really big things. Her net play has been uh, outstanding as of late, and we know we're going to get big things from her moving forward. What are you looking at on the men's side for this season? Uh, men, uh, like I said before, we really like to, to get that first CAC win. I think that's something that's on our mind. We're thinking about, I think we're very motivated to try to achieve that. Uh, I think it's realistic. I think if we're, if we're progressing the way that, that I see us progressing, I think it'll happen. Um, some veteran players and a lot of new players. So there's a real interesting mix yeah. of kind of the older guys, the new guys. And right now we're really enjoying seeing everyone kind of come together, mesh, and uh, it's going to make for a real exciting season. And, and looking at last season, especially with your doubles pairing, uh, you're going to give a lot of guys a lot of different shots, you know, to, to come out and, and play well. And uh, I, th I think that's interesting to see. And uh, what, w what has worked out well uh, in the men's preseason? Uh, specifically, who are who are you looking at? We have right now 14 uh, on the men's team, so it's 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 really interesting. I think we have a few players at the top that that we're looking at that I think can be huge in the doubles. Uh, I think our team starts with Shasta. Uh, he played number one singles last year. Uh, just just a great kid. Uh, we love him. Uh, he's always been very good at the top of the lineup. I think he'll be in the in the mix for. Uh, position at first doubles. We added Joey Cox, who is a uh, senior this year. He actually played a few years ago here. He returned to the team. Uh, you know, big guy, lefty, uh, all around. You know, great game. Uh, we think he's going to be huge in the doubles. We added Nolan Jones, and he's a transfer from Division One Western Illinois University. Uh, we got to see him come out this week. Uh, we love what we see with him, and uh, just just really a plethora of of other guys that we all think are going to be huge. Uh, Derek Thompson's look really good. Chad O'Neill, um, you know, guys from Fort Hill High School have really been uh, really been big for our team this preseason, and uh, just a whole slew of guys: uh, Tim Goldring, Jeffrey Goldring, Justin Davis, uh, Stephen Glassbrenner. I mean, just a lot of guys. Uh, Aaron Beckner from last year, Nathan Farlow. So it's really uh, you know anyone's uh, anyone's guess right now, kind of who's going to end up in the doubles lineup, but uh, we certainly don't have a shortage to choose from, which is uh, um, always a good thing. The season begins with McDaniel and Salisbury in, in the same weekend here. What what are you looking for? What What's a successful weekend for your teams? I, I definitely think that uh, we, we're going to be very competitive with McDaniel. Uh, we're very much looking forward to that match. Um, I definitely see us as, as pretty, pretty even, pretty eye to eye. And... Um, Hopefully we can squeak out a couple wins against McDaniel. I think Salisbury on Sunday is going to be a challenge for us. They are traditionally – They're top uh, three on both sides last year. Yeah, they they are very solid. I think they're even top 30 in the country um, in some polls. So, um, you know, hopefully we go down there. We we do our best. We play our best tennis. Uh, not sure what's going to happen. Um, can't really predict that. But what I can predict is uh, we're going to play our A game. We're going to give our best effort. Couldn't be more excited to start, uh, you know, the, the year off with these two matches and being on the road. We're going to really see uh, the fight and the character of our team this weekend. So very excited. Well, we're looking forward to it. We're looking forward to having you on the Bobcast every week. Aaron Wolf, thank you. Thanks so much. Back on the Bobcast for the final time this season, we have men's basketball head coach Webb Hatch. And this is our chance to sort of look back on the season. Frostburg men's basketball Made the playoffs for the first time since 2013, finishing 9-9 nine and nine in conference, 11-15 and 15 overall, falling at Mary Washington this past Tuesday in the postseason. 
Some highlights, beating number seven York here at Bobcat Arena, winning it at Christopher Newport uh, in overtime. At that time, they were ranked number 17 in the country. This men's basketball team had a win over every other team in the conference outside of Salisbury. Not too shabby for a team that was picked to finish dead last in the conference. So, Coach Webhatch, how are you going to, to remember this 17 and 18 season? Well, <laughs> first of all, when we were picked last, uh, my coaching staff and I and the players, we didn't think a whole lot about that because we, we knew we were going to be more competitive yeah. than that. But, you know, so be it. Um, you know, going into the last five games of the season, we still had a chance at, at finishing the as high as tied for second. Mm -hmm. Now, we had a four-game losing streak, and, and three of those losses we we played uh, without Chris Costin, who was out with a concussion. And, you know, that's that's part of the game. You have to make adjustments. But I, I do think that hurt us during that run. Um, we were in a ton of close games. And I haven't gone through and, and looked – see how many games we were involved in that were, you know, decided by, you know, less than five or six points, but it was quite a few. Yes. And we had four overtime games and won all four of them and had a couple of other games that came real close to getting to an overtime. And I remember after we played three overtime games, uh, and I believe the CNU game may have been the fourth overtime The game. last one was Southern Virginia. Oh, uh, you're right. Here. You're right. Uh, the Southern Virginia game, yeah, when we had that here, I remember when we went to sit down before the start of overtime, I just said to the guys, we don't lose overtime games. Nope. And, you know, that was that, that mentality on, on our ball club. Um, obviously, you'd like to win more games than, than you did, but there there wasn't a single game the entire season that, that we weren't in. Even some games, you know, um, where we got down, we came back and we made runs at people just like the last game we played on, on Tuesday night. We didn't play particularly well the first half. We were down eight, and then we got down 16, and then we came back and got it all the way to two and had the last possession. And I think most coaches would tell you, if, if you have the last possession of a game with the opportunity to either tie it or win it, that's about all you can ask. Uh, if the shot yep. goes down and you either tie it or win it, uh, you tie it, you go in overtime and try to play five more minutes and win it, or if not, you know, maybe you hit the shot to, to win it. So that's what happened with us. We came back from 16 down. We had the ball with 3.5 seconds left. We got a timeout. We ran a play. Unfortunately, we didn't get the results we wanted. Um, so um, I, I'm I'm really tickled with the, the way our guys played this year and the fact that we competed and, and they balled in and they never gave up. Uh, and it was nice to get in the conference tournament again. Um, and, you know, our last home game against Wesley, I thought we played as well as we played all year. So that was very rewarding to close it out with that kind of um, win for us. Is there a moment that stands out this season that, that you're going to carry with you and when you look back on this one? And, and there are some, some really good moments, and there might be some under-the-radar ones that, that you might think of. What, what stands out from this year for you? Uh, there's a couple. The uh, the Case Western game, the very first game of the year, when Jordan Johnson hit a three at the buzzer to send it into overtime, that was huge. Mm -hmm. uh, brand new player to our program. Uh, we're down three. There's seconds left in the game. Uh, Lawrence Pettis has the foresight to know time and score and pitch it up to Jordan on the wing, and Jordan knows time and score. Uh, doesn't drive it to the basket and, and shoot a two because it would have still been one down. Catches it, lets it go. We hit a three. So that I'll remember that one. It was the first game of the uh -huh. year. Uh, the win at CNU, you know, I, I coached 10 years in Marymount and 19 years here, and, and I'd never won a game as a head coach at CNU. Um, we weren't in the same conference with them when I was at, at Marymount, but we played there, I don't know, uh, four or five times over sure. a ten-year period, and never never won a game there. And then we had played CNU a couple of times uh, bef there since I came here before they joined this league, and we hadn't won there. We had beaten them here, uh, so to go down there and win that game, and in that game, Darren Campbell hit a three at the buzzer to send it mm -hmm. in overtime. Uh, so, 
you know, those are two I particularly uh, remember. Um, I thought the York game here, we, we, we played about as good as we could play. Uh, I've often told people that when we shoot the ball well, we're pretty good. Yeah. Uh, and if you're not in the, in the coaching, maybe you don't understand it. But I, go, I said, you know, Villanova can, can play bad and they're still pretty good. Yes. Uh, when we play well, we're pretty good. And when we play bad, we, you know, we're not a particularly good team. And it all, it all starts with whether you can put the ball in the basket or not because uh, kids tend to play better defense after they score, even though when you don't score, it's when you really need them to play good defense. Uh, but their body language is so much better after a good offensive possession. They work hard and all those things. So the York game was a particularly rewarding win for us because we, we, we played so well, and York came in here ranked seventh Seven in the in country. The country. Uh, I think they're still number one in our region. Yes. Uh, so they've got a great ball club. I picked them to win the conference this year. Other people picked CNU, but I thought they had the best team. I still do. Uh, and then the, the last game we had here last Saturday was pretty rewarding because that was, that was senior day and, of course, my last home game here. And uh, Wesley had beaten us up at their place earlier. It was a pretty close game and, and about 14 minutes left in the game. Uh, we just – we had a couple of calls that didn't go our way, and we started sulking a little bit. And um, next thing you know, they they've got a 12 to two run. And I think we wound up losing by 18 or 20 up there. So to to bounce back uh, and play them as well as we did here, and at that time we had lost four straight games. So it was those are probably the three games that stand out the most, I guess. You you mentioned the Wesley game being the senior day for for this senior class to to be the first one to make the playoffs since 2012 or 2013. They had never done it before. How important were they to making this year happen? Oh, huge, huge. And, you know, I've been asked several times about the value of senior leadership. You know, we're not a major, major university that has the one-and-done kids that come in. Um, the the mid-majors at the Division One level that – that play very well and make noise in the NCAA tournament usually have some seniors on their team. Yes. Uh, so I, I think at the Division Two and Division Three level, um, if you can if you can get some seniors in your program who want one they they buy into however you want things done, two they get in the weight room and they get stronger, three they work on their game and become better players, uh, both physically and intellectually. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's it's. It's invaluable because the first day of practice, you've got kids who already know some of the drills you're going to do. If you're running offensive sets or defensive concepts that you've run for two or three years, they all this stuff comes back very quickly. You know, they can provide leadership by explaining to young players, this is how we do things. You know, this is not how we do things. So the leadership's invaluable. And, and then, of course, if they're motivated, that they really want to have a good senior year, and close out their career, that's that's important as well. And, you know, we had six seniors this year. Four have been in, have been in the program for four years, one for three years, and one was a first-year player. Uh, so that's five guys that have been in your program for at least three years, and, and that helped an awful lot. I remember after the CNU game down there, I was watching their broadcast, and uh, Coach K for CNU mentioned three or four of your seniors by name just coming off the bench and uh, pointed to that as a big reason why you guys beat CNU down there. Is that a feather in the cap for, for those guys to be recognized about like that? Sure. And, and John texted me after the game and, and, and brought that up. We lost down there, I believe, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, and we missed a, a bunch of free throws uh, in the last ten minutes of the game. <clears throat> that probably cost us the ball game. And um, his guys made them. And I was standing in the hallway 15, 20 minutes after the game, not looking particularly happy. And John Krikorian, you know, he walked up and uh, you know, he said, hey, it's a tough loss. And I said, yeah, <laughs> someday we're <laughs> going to get you guys here. And he said, well, you know, 
I got juniors and seniors that, that, that made those free throws that wouldn't have made them two years ago that some of your freshmen and sophomores missed. And that was the difference mm -hmm. in winning and losing the ball game. And so we, we had Chris Costin contributed off the bench. Jeff McMorris contributed off the bench. Uh, Darren Campbell contributed. Uh, Johnson great, had great five load. points in overtime. Campbell hit the big shot yep. late. So there was some – There obviously there was some some kids that, that contributed that – weren't necessarily starters or are not always primetime players for us. And John recognized that. And, he, you know, he's been there because he, he, they made it to the Final Four two years ago, and he had a team that was loaded with juniors and seniors that year. That, that's pretty cool. Speaking of, of juniors and seniors coming into next year, uh, three, three guys who weren't seniors had some pretty big breakout seasons. I remember talking to you about Lawrence Pettis, uh, before the season, and the biggest thing I got from you is is how fast he is and how quick he is. I saw from him this season what's going to resonate with me is he had three blocks all year, two were in overtime against Southern Virginia in big moments. He hits five threes against York. You look at the games that you won, especially some big games and close games, he was the driving force behind it, and he was just a competitive force in those games. How can someone, and, and I don't know how tall Lawrence is, how can someone like that dominate a game to the point where he's willing your team to win? And uh, what can you say about his competitiveness and his progression through the year? Well, I told him last May, I said, you are our starting point guard in 17-18. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm basically giving you the keys to the car and you're going to be our starting point guard, and, and we do have a couple point guard recruits coming in, but I don't expect that they're going to beat you out, okay? Mm -hmm. They're going to push you, and they're going to challenge you for playing time and make you a better player and all that, but, you know, I expect you to be our starting point guard, and he started all but, I think, three games for us this year, and one of them was senior day when he didn't start. Uh, I don't know, what is he, 5'9"? Uh, I think he wound up second in the conference – and assists. He led the conference in assists per game, second in minutes. That's right. But 5.3 assists a game. Uh -huh. His assist to turn, turnover ratio is outstanding. Number one in the conference and, as well. And then when you throw in steals, you know, he was in the top ten in the conference in steals. Yeah, I, I say the ball is almost like a yo-yo in his hands. And years ago, I don't know who the coach was that, that I heard this somewhere, that, you know, the best thing – the best way to beat a full court press is to have an all American point guard. <laughs> you know, people can talk about, you know, you want to pass side middle, side middle and all these things and and, 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 that, and that's all true. But if you've got a really great point guard and you can get the ball in his hands and he can break a press, whether it be a zone press or a man to man press, either because he can dribble through it or he makes really good decisions on, you know, passing out of the double teams, then you can handle pressure and, and Lawrence was pretty good at doing that. I mean, this past Tuesday night, Mary Washington never came out. Uh, mm -hmm. Most games I get him out for a couple of minutes. You know, sometimes second half he doesn't come out at all. But usually the first half I'm able to get him out for two or three minutes. Uh, but he never came off the floor. Uh, and that's hard to do, 40 minutes. Uh, and that was a very intense game. And, of course, we had to – use a lot of energy when we got 16 down to get back in it. And when we were doing that, we were playing full court man-to-man -man and we were trapping and he was intimately involved in all that. Uh, so he's a very, very competitive player. I mean, you mentioned I've got three – we have three starters coming back. Uh, he'll be a junior uh, at the point. We've got Daniel Alexander coming back who will be a junior who, you know, who plays a wing. And then we've got Edwin Cole coming back who would be a senior, who's a post player. Um, so the cupboard's not bare uh, for whoever follows me. And they've got, he's got three quality players back. Uh, Edwin averaged a double-double for the year. Uh, he led the conference in rebounding. Daniel Alexander averaged, you know, 12 or 13 points a game, about five or six rebounds. He, he's a 6'2 wing um, who – He's extremely quick off the dribble. Is very, very, very coachable. He might be our smartest player. I mean, he really understands what's going on. He knows what every player is supposed to do in every situation. Uh, extremely quick off the dribble. 
developed a three-point shot this year. Um, so those three guys are coming back, and and then we've got we've got five freshmen who didn't get much playing time, uh, but they all have the potential to play at this level. Uh, and then Desmond Lighty is the backup point guard who, again, didn't get much playing time because it's hard not to have Lawrence on the court, but Desmond had to play against Lawrence every day in practice. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, I feel real good about the situation as far as, you know, what we're leaving with the new coach. And, you know, with a little bit of recruiting, uh, we really need to bring in a, a guy who can shoot it uh, with Tyler Michael leaving in his 17, 18 points a game. Uh, so, and we're involved with some recruits, and they know the whole situation. They know that I'm retiring from here. Uh, several of the kids are very interested because this is where they want to go to school. And then some other guys are kind of thinking, you know, we want to see who the coach is going to be and all sure. that. But the program's, in, I, I think, in, in, in very good shape uh, for next year. I do want to touch on uh, the seasons that Edwin Cole and Daniel Alexander had. Um, Edwin Cole set the, set the FSU offensive rebounding record this year, as a matter of fact, single okay. season, and uh, number four in the country in offensive rebounds this year. And he's also top ten in the country in blocked shots. Um, it's, it's staggering to look at him from last year to this year, just in terms of the numbers, block shots, rebounding, and the fact that he did it next to other front court players like Campbell and Goss, who are more face-up, finesse players. How much more could you have even asked of Edwin Cole with, with the year that he just had? Not much. He, we, <laughs> we had hoped that he could get us 12 or 14 points a night and 8 to 10 rebounds. And he wound up averaging right at 12 points a game. 12 and 10. And 12 and 10. So he, he, and, he and he shot right around 50% from the floor mm-hmm. and close to 70% from the free throw line. He did not a, attempt it. He made one three the entire year, but it was right as the buzzer expired uh-huh. at halftime of a game. Uh, but that's the only one he attempted all year. Um, so he has come a long way. He only played one year of high school basketball. Really? He played his senior year at High Point High School. And when he came in here as a freshman, he was extremely raw. But sometimes you know, some of your high school athletes get burned out, you know, in high school because they play, you know. Especially with specialization. Yeah, they play AAU basketball. So they start playing AAU basketball when in, in the sixth grade. So they're playing basketball all year long for six years. And – all of a sudden, they're 18 years old and they finish high school, and they go, I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, and then I think it happens with soccer players, too. Sure. Because they play soccer year-round, and even baseball sometimes. So that was, you know, good for him in that he wasn't burned out, and he was still eager, and there was, there was a ton he, he, he didn't even know. Uh, and when he came in, he didn't even make our travel squad. Uh, and he didn't travel with us first semester. Uh, I remember our first conference game that year was up at Penn State Harrisburg on a weeknight, and he and, and another uh, student and one of our managers who didn't travel, they drove up to the game just to see us play. Uh, and I thought, well, that's kind of neat that he did that. And then he made the travel squad second semester, and in late January he started getting some playing time, I mean meaningful minutes. And, you know, so for the last – you know, eight games of the year, he was in our rotation and playing. And then he made huge strides as a sophomore. And then this past summer, the summer of 17, he didn't go home. He lived up here all summer. He had an off, off-campus off apartment. He got a job working over at Sears in, in, in the mall in Cumberland. And he lived here all summer long. And he was over here in the, in the weight room three to five times a week. He was in the gym five or six times a week getting up shots, and it paid off. Now, you know, we're not Division One, where you, you, your team goes to summer school and, and they can actually practice some in the summer and all that. I mean, we can't do anything. He did all this on his own. He, he made that kind of commitment. So he made a huge, huge improvement, um, both in his strength and his skill set, and he's still hungry. I mean, he – he could have a really, really good year next year uh, as, as a senior. 
Uh, he put together an all-conference caliber season. I'm looking forward to seeing those teams when they come out. And uh, finally, Daniel Alexander, first year as a starter. You played him over 30 minutes a game. He scored in double figures. And he was a Swiss Army knife, second on the team in rebounding, assists, steals, and blocks. Did he surprise even you this season? I'm going to say no <laughs> because you know, Daniel was a football player and a basketball player you know, as a kid and in high school and initially came here to play football. And we were aware of who he was and we'd seen him play. But, you know, football had recruited him to be a wide receiver. And then he decided after the preseason, right before their first game, uh, his freshman year, that he was going to give up football. And he, he came to me and said, that's what he, I said, well, I can't promise you that you're going to be on our team. Okay, you sure this is what you want to do? Yeah. So, uh, you know, he got playing a lot of playing time for us over the last third of the season last year. Probably started a half a dozen games. Mm -hmm. And then we had, we had a chance to be pretty good this year because – the spring of 17 and the summer of 17 was going to be the first time in about six years that he didn't have to worry about football in the off season. You know, lifting weights for football and doing the things that you do in the summer. Mm -hmm. He could he could devote that time and energy to basketball, and we said yeah, that should help him a lot. Um, so we expected him to be better. You know, we didn't have predictions on what his what his stats were going to be. Um, but he's so coachable, and he never questions anything you ask him to do, and he processes information so well. And I said earlier, he, he knows what every person is supposed to do in every situation on our team. And I've, I've even seen him in practices, particularly early in the year, where you know, we'd be running a, an offensive set, and he might be with a freshman. And the freshman is confused, and he would kind of shove the guy in the right direction, saying, uh -huh. saying you're supposed to go there. This is what you're supposed to do. And he knew what that kid was supposed to be doing, even though it wasn't his position. So, you know, he has a chance to, you know, be a pretty good player next year as well. One thing that, that all three of them have in common, and I'm excited about next year, is, is how competitive all three of those guys are. How, how can they harness that competitiveness – um, and use it next year. What what do you see in, in, in the future for, for this team? What's the what's what's the ceiling, perhaps? Well, I, I don't. You know, it's hard to predict things. Players don't always. Um, if you look at their careers, their, their their careers don't always just continue to go up and up and up and up and up and up where they peak as a senior. Sometimes. As a freshman, they don't get much playing time, and then they have this breakout year as a sophomore, and then all of a sudden their junior year they go, they, they go down for whatever reason, and then they go back up as a senior. Or some kids will improve from freshman to sophomore, improve from sophomore to junior, and then for, for some reason they get senioritis and don't have particularly good senior that, years. That's true in sports beyond basketball. I've seen that, and D3. It, it could be that you know they're a little tired of playing, or maybe they get maybe they get complacent. Uh, you know, there's an old thing: you, you either get better or you get worse. You don't remain the same. So if they have a great junior year, maybe they they don't think they have to do it. They have you know train that hard in the off season or work because they just had this great junior year, and then they come back and they're not in quite as good a shape. And other people have gotten better, and now they have a disappointing senior year. You know, I can't predict all those things. I mean, Lawrence will be a junior. Edwin will be a senior. Daniel will be a junior. So. You know, on paper, all three of them could have pretty good years next year. But there's a lot of factors that you can't, you know, account for. Uh, I'm certainly going to be rooting for them. Uh, but it's a good situation to have a point guard coming back who's got experience and to have a two, three-man coming back who's, you know, got experience and to have a six, 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 seven kid coming back that averaged a double-double. I mean, the game Tuesday night, Edwin had uh, – 25 points and 17 rebounds. Nine of them were offensive, yeah, too. Yeah, that, that, and we had we had two offensive rebounds at halftime, and that was one of the things we talked about. So we've got to do a better job of rebounding in the second half, and, and we did. We had 15 offensive rebounds in the second half. We out-rebounded them 25 to 13 or something, I think, in the second half. Uh, so he was a real man uh, on uh, Tuesday night. And so, I, you know, 
I want both of them to have great years next year. Uh, but there's a lot of things you can't predict, so who knows. Well, finally, what what, what is next for you, Coach? You know, I'm, um, I'm relocating um, to Sandbridge Beach, which is um, a five-mile beach community on the southeastern uh, tip of Virginia Beach. It's right on the Virginia Beach, North Carolina line. It's a great little community. There are no hotels there. It's all beach houses. Uh, and I have some dear friends that live down there. And I built a house there 12 years ago, and I've been renting it out. And uh, I really love that lifestyle, you know, sand in your shoes kind of thing. Yes. And so, I'm, you know, it's, you know, they don't have summer there year round. It's in Virginia, so they do have winter. But the winters are not as harsh as they are here and, and you know, if they get eight or ten inches of snow it's gone in a week uh well you know we get eight or ten inches here it's here <laughs> yes uh, for the most part um uh, so i'm looking forward to to living down there um uh, I, I don't know beyond that uh i'm retiring as the coach here at frostburg state i'm not saying i will never coach again uh you know we'll, we'll see if if some type of opportunity may be become available that someone would think I could be a good fit for them and I would think it would be a enjoyable experience for me um, but I plan to be living down there by June and then we'll kind of go from there well 19 seasons correct here at 19 here one is an assistant at VMI 10 is a head coach at Marymount uh, nine as an assistant at Virginia Wesleyan and five as a high school coach uh, so 44 years. Wow. Well, this this past year has been a, a lot of fun in men's basketball. I just want to say thank you, and thank you for doing this with us every week. And go ahead and listen to all the older episodes if you want to relive this I season. I will. I will. Thanks. Thanks, Coach.